everybody? We are continuing our series on the book of Acts this morning. The Acts of the Holy Spirit and the Acts of those who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, all of us are different. I think it was amazing we were speaking about how we are a body and the body has different parts. And all of us have different gifts have different talents, have different abilities, and we all have different IQs. Mm. What's your IQ? Your IQ is the the measurement of your intelligence. And intelligence is basically the ability to learn new things quickly and efficiently. So all of us have different levels of intelligence. All of us have different IQs. Some of us have very high IQs. Some of us have lower IQs. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter how smart you think you are. The title of my lesson today is, You're Not Smarter Than God. And why do I say that? Because we're going to read about someone who is incredibly smart. Much smarter than many of us here today. And this guy, it didn't matter all of his knowledge, all of his intelligence, all of the gifts and talents that he had. It was nothing without God. I want to tell you that all of your gifts, all of your abilities, all of your talents are nothing without God. Amen. We, lived, we left our story last week with Paul. He was in Corinth and how he'd been there for a year and a half and how God blessed him in the ministry there. And he built up the church and eventually traveled to uh, Ephesus. And he left his travel companions, Priscilla and Aquila, there in Ephesus. And he continued traveling around Asia Minor, preaching the word. And this is where we pick up our story in Acts chapter 18 in verse 24. The Bible says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him into their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Point number one, you can't know everything. Here we read about Apollos. Now, I think for for many of us who have read this story before is that we really don't give Apollos enough credit. Why do I say that? Because we can study the Bible with people and it's like anyone who is like remotely clever or anyone who grew up with a Bible in their hands, we're like, oh, you're just like Apollos. (laughs) And we say that much too liberally because Apollos was more awesome than we realize. And I'm going to tell you just how awesome this guy was. The Bible, it gives a very brief description of him, but it's very deep what's going on here. It says that he was a native of Alexandria. So Alexandria was founded in 331 BC by Alexander the Great. It was a new city that he wanted to really to declare his might and power and majesty. And it was going to be the new Greek center for trade in the Mediterranean. Alexandria, within a generation, grew to be the largest, uh, within, sorry, within a century, grew to be the largest city in the ancient world. And by the first century, it was only uh, exceeded by Rome. So it was the second largest city in the entire world. It was known as the ancient capital of knowledge and learning. You had things like the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which at the time was the tallest building in the ancient world. And it was one of the longest uh, preserved ancient wonders of the seven ancient wonders. And you had the Library of Alexandria, which had a collection of 400,000 papyrus scrolls, which would be the equivalent of about 100,000 books. The Jews uh, in Alexandria, they they made up a a large majority. It was about 35%. So more than a third of the city was Jewish. So it was kind of broken roughly up into thirds. You had a third Jewish, a third Egyptian, and a third Greek. And the Jews were a major force in Alexandria, so much so that the second uh, Ptolemaic king, uh, Ptolemy II, he commissioned the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures. Why? Because he, was, he felt like the Jews were really important. He wanted to know about uh, this, this Hebrew God and this part of this community. And the Septuagint was uh, commissioned and uh, developed and translated in Alexandria. So this gives you an idea of the city where Apollos came from. He came from a very important, very prominent, very wealthy and... Uh, very important city in the ancient world. 
Now, the Bible describes him, it says that he was a learned man. The Greek word for this is the word logios, which means learned, skilled in literature and the arts, especially history, skilled in speech, eloquent, and rational. So this guy, he was kind of the epitome of what the Greeks idealized. They're like, wow, this guy, he is articulate, he's rational, he's skilled in the arts and literature and history. And that's a lot of what many people value today. It's like, man, that's who the type of person I want to be when I get older. That's why we go to universities. That's why we study the arts and histories. Yeah. It says that he had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. The Greek word for this word thorough is dynatos. It's where we get our, our word dynamite, it's speaking about an explosive power. And this word, it means able, powerful, mighty, strong, having a wealth and influence, strong in soul. So he was a very like a, a principled man. He had very, very strong convictions. It says that he, this word means resilient. So he was able to bounce back quickly from setbacks. I think this is a very uh, rare trait, particularly in men today, to find a man who isn't deterred, who when he sets his mind to do something, he's re relentless and persistent until he accomplishes his goal. That's who Apollos was. And then lastly, it says that this word, dinatos, it means virtuous. So this guy was a good guy. He had high integrity. He was a morally sound person. It says that he was instructed in the way of the Lord. Now, this, this Greek word for this is katekeo. And what it means is to teach orally, instruct, or inform by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So as we break down our understanding of this guy, Apollos, is that this guy was from one of the most important cities in the ancient worlds. He was ex educated. He would have been wealthy, prominent. He would have been all of these things. He was a, a deep, strong, moral character. He was a forceful, powerful person. But when it came to his understanding of Jesus, he had been instructed by word of mouth. So this guy, he had done his detective work. He had investigated because uh, at this time, it's 49 AD. It's about 15, 16 years after uh, Jesus had died on the cross. So he's heard about what had been going on in Palestine, particularly with the Jewish connection with Palestine. Now, in uh, the year 38 AD, there was a, uh, a purge of the Jews in Alexandria, where the Greeks, they rioted, where they killed many of the Jews, they desecrated and destroyed the synagogues. And so for him to say, persevere, he's like, okay, no, I'm a Jew. He's like, I'll stand in the face of persecution. I'll stand up to the, the Roman uh, oppression, the Greek oppression. And he had heard about Jesus. He, he was investigating Jesus. And it says that he taught about Jesus accurately. So he didn't just listen to, to hearsay about Jesus. He'd actually gone and investigated it. Mm -hmm. This right off shows about his character. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people today, they hear hearsay and they just believe it. Yeah. But he didn't do that. He actually investigated and he, he went to the sources. He checked his sources. He checked his to see that it was actually credible. And it says that he taught about Jesus accurately. So what does this mean? Is that you can learn the truth accurately if you're willing to put in the work. Right. But you can't know everything. What was the problem with Apollos? Is that because he had been instructed orally by word of mouth, there were parts that were missing. And I think this is really important for us. We've got to recognize you can't know everything. Is that even if you have a powerful character, even if you are strong, even if you're resilient, even if you're charismatic, even if you're articulate, even if you have all of these natural gallants, abilities, even if you put in the work, you can still miss out key parts of the story, yes. essential parts of the story. And that's what it was because it says that he only knew about the baptism of John. Well, the baptism of John is very well recorded, so he clearly would have been able to have researched that and to found uh, witnesses and eyewitness testimonies about the baptism of John. So he was able to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And people can do that with Jesus. They can connect the dots yeah. quite well, but there's still going to be missing parts of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with him. Now, what happens? Priscilla and Aquila, they, they hear that he's missing stuff, and they teach him the word more adequately. So what does this mean? It means that not only was he noble, but he was also humble. Yeah. This is a rare combination 
Because usually when people are prideful, it's because they have something to be prideful about. And Apollos, he had many things that he could have relied on. He could have relied on his education, could have relied on his pedigree, could have relied on his heritage, could have relied on his talents and abilities, his intelligence, his own research that he had gone to. He could have relied on his IQ because he likely was a very intelligent person, but he didn't. He was willing to be taught by Priscilla and Aquila. Now, who were Priscilla and Aquila? They were tent makers. They were ordinary people. But this is the thing. If you really love the truth, yeah. it doesn't matter who tells you the truth. You see, Apollos didn't look down on them like, oh, you're just from uh, this province. Oh, you're not from Alexandria. You're, you haven't been educated the way that I have. You haven't got the degrees that I have. You haven't had the teachers that I've had. That wasn't his mindset at all. He's like, oh, so I'm wrong? Okay, tell me, tell me the truth. Now, what happens what happens to this? Well, it changes everything. Because it says that uh, when he went, uh, explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. What happened? What happened when he allowed himself to, to be humbled? When he humbled himself, he allowed himself to be taught by other people that he didn't know, that weren't from his city, that weren't from his culture, or whatever. He allowed himself to grow. Wow. Mm. He allowed himself to change. And he allowed himself to be useful, to have an impact. He even had a greater impact than Paul had had. Because Paul writes in 2 Corinthians that he's like, I was not a gifted speaker. So Paul was not able to refute the Jews in public debate like Apollos was. Wow. So Apollos had a talent and a gift that Paul didn't even have. Wow. And God used him in a different way than Paul had. Why? Because he was humble. Wow. Why? Because he allowed himself to be taught. I got to ask you, are you humble? Do you let yourself be taught by people? Or only certain people? People that you perceive to be superior to you? Is that where does that sense of superiority come from? How do you measure a person's status or stature? Is it based on their intelligence, their wealth? Their, their, it doesn't matter. Paul's like, the truth is the truth. And I don't care where it comes from. I'm going to follow the truth. Amen. Are you willing to be taught the truth? When we look at Alexander the Great, the, the founder of Alexandria, he was called uh, Alexander the Great because he did great things. <laughs> and and uh, sometimes it's like, we want to call ourselves or whatever, Colby the Great. But it's like, have you done great things? <laughs> Alexander did do great things, and that title was well-deserved. He had another title. The title was Conqueror of Worlds. Wow. Why? Because that's what he did. He conquered the known worlds. Alexander the Great was a prodigy. He was a military genius. He revolutionized warfare so much that it is still studied today, wow. more than 2,000 years later. Wow. But even Alexander the Great didn't know everything. Yeah. After Alexander the Great, he came across from Macedonia. He crossed the Hellespont to uh, Asia Minor. He fought against the Persians there. He defeated Darius. Uh, and as he came through, he uh, conquered... Uh, all of Palestine, all of the major fortress cities. And then he went and he captured Egypt. But it's interesting because there was one place that there's no mention in history of him going to, which is Jerusalem, which is very interesting. Because it's like, okay, if you, if you char chart his, his army's movement, he just went from fortress, from city to city to city, completely leveling them, just destroying them, sacking them. He destroyed all of the major coastal fortresses, all of the major capital cities except the largest city. He destroyed all the military outposts except the largest military outpost. That begs the question, why? Why did Alexander not go to Jerusalem? Well, according to the historian Josephus, he did. While, uh, while Alexander was uh, laying siege to Tyre, which was a coastal fortress city, uh, it said that he sent uh, envoys and letters to the surrounding cities, including to Jerusalem, demanding that they provide resources and food and soldiers to fight in his army. 
And the high priest at the time said, uh, no, we, we swore an oath to be loyal to Darius. I cannot take arms against Darius. And Alexander was enraged. And he's like, okay, you're next. And so after he laid siege and after he leveled Seir, uh, he took his army and marched up to Jerusalem. And the high priests, they were distraught. They're like, what's going to happen? They're going to destroy Jerusalem. There's no way we can oppose them. So they prayed to God. And God said, open the gates of the city and go out to meet him. And so they did. So they opened the gates of the city. They didn't fight Alexander. They went out to meet him. And it says that Alexander saluted the high priest. And his men, they said to him, why have you done this? You haven't done this to any other religious authority. And Alexander says, before I came here on this conquest, I had a dream of a man dressed in these robes who told me that God had chosen me to come and to urgently come and to attack. And he says, I've never met anyone that wore these robes before. And so I don't acknowledge him. I acknowledge his God. And then he came into Jerusalem and uh, he offered sacrifices to the Jewish God. Now, it says that the high priest then went on to read Alexander prophecies about himself. So if you come with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Or sorry, Daniel chapter 8, verse 3. It says, I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west, the north, the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue it from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came toward the two-horned two ram it had seen standing beside the canal and charged it in a great rage. I saw it attack the ram furiously striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. This is a prophecy by the prophet Daniel, who prophesied during the middle of the 6th century BC. So this is uh, about 200 years before Alexander the Great was ever born. In verse 20, you're like, okay, that's cool. You got a ram, you got a goat. What does that have to do with Alexander? Well, let me tell you. Come on, babe. This is the explanation of this prophecy, what it means. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Medea and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece. The large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace that one as was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. Now, you got to understand at this time, this is the equivalence of Greece. Greece was such a small, weak, insignificant kingdom at the edge of the earth, and Persia was the superpower. It wasn't, sorry, it wasn't even Persia, it was Babylon. So this was before Persia had even, ar even ar arisen. This is Babylon and Persia. And this is the equivalent of saying, okay, that there's going to be uh, this king that rises up in Azerbaijan. And he's going to travel across all of Asia and he's going to destroy China. Wow. That's like the equivalent of like the tiny, tiny little country overpowering this massive country. In chapter 11, in verse 2, it says this, Now that I tell you the truth, there... Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise and will rule with a great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled up toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. These prophecies are so accurate that uh, critics they say that there's no way it could have been written in the middle of the 6th century BC. They say it was written in the 1st uh, or 2nd century, uh, and it was written as history, not as prophecy. Wow. However, we have archaeological evidence, such as the Cyrus Scroll, that proves that Daniel was written when it was written. And if you don't believe me, you can go to the British Museum and you can look at the Cyrus Scroll yourself. <laughs> 
But not only in Daniel that it does it prophesy about uh, Alexander, it speaks about how he would raise up and how he'd be powerful, but even in Zechariah, it specifically charts the path that Alexander would go, and it talks about the cities that would be destroyed. And in this, there's one city that stands out in particular, which was the city of Tyre, the one that Alexander had just destroyed before coming to Jerusalem. See, Tyre was a fortress island about, um, I think it was about half a mile off of the coast. And so it was an island that was completely impenetrable. And for 150 years, kings had tried to conquer this island and no one could do it. You had Sennacherib, followed by his son, uh, Urshadon, followed by his son, uh, Ashurbanipal, followed by his son, Sherman Nalazar. Four successive kings, one after the other, they all tried to attack it and they couldn't attack it. Then you had Nebuchadnezzar, who conquered all of the cities in uh, Palestine except for Tyre. He had laid siege to Tyre for 13 years. And he weakened it, but he didn't conquer it. But the Bible says that there would be an army that would come and conquer all of these cities, including Tyre. Now, this prophecy also says that Jerusalem would be protected. Wow. That it would be the only city that wouldn't be sacked by this incoming army. Wow. Alexander didn't know that. He didn't know about the prophecies about him. He's just like, I'm just going, I'm just killing people and destroying armies. And then, oh, so you're telling me that God has chosen me? That this was prophesied about 200 years before I was even existed? Wow. Oh, I, I didn't know that. And sure enough, it says that his kingdom would be divided and not go to his descendants, but go to four different parts, which is exactly what happened to Alexander the Great's kingdom. It was divided into four different kingdoms. And none of them were as powerful at his kingdom. So the Bible is true, guys. You, you can look at the prophecies that support it and everything. But what does this mean for us? Alexander, the conqueror of worlds, he still had the humility to learn something that he didn't know. He's like, I don't know about these Hebrew prophecies. I didn't know that these are references to me. So you're saying that I'm going to be victorious and that I'm going to completely destroy this Persian uh, empire? That's what we're saying. And so that's why he went. And that's why he was so confident. He was so sure that he was going to be victorious. He's like, oh, the Bible says it. The Bible says that I've been chosen by God. But he didn't know that before. What do you not know about the Bible? What are the, the prophecies in the Bible that relate to your life that you're completely ignorant of? Do you have the humility to let someone teach you like Alexander did? We see what happened as a result of Alexander allowing himself to be taught and believing the Bible. Because I'm convinced that Alexander believed the Bible. Why? Because Josephus records that Alexander completely protected Jerusalem, allowed Jerusalem to continue in religious freedom, and didn't uh, impose any tribute on the seventh year, just as the Bible says that it's supposed to happen. So he's like, okay, yep, I believe in God totally believe in the Bible, and I'm going to let you guys continue practicing the Bible because I know that God is with me. Wow. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Come on, babe. So what's the challenge? Be humble. Recognize your limited knowledge. You could be an expert in one thing. That's awesome. Alexander was the best of the best of military geniuses. In all of history, there are few that have even compared to his brilliance. But he wasn't an expert on the Bible. You could be an expert on languages or an expert on physics or chemistry or calculus, or you could be an expert on computer science and you could be an expert in all of these different things, but you might not be an expert in the Bible. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Just be humble. Let yourself be taught. So that way you can learn something new, you can grow, and that God can use you more powerfully than you ever thought possible. Amen. Point number two, it's okay to be wrong. Apollos was able to properly use his talents once he recognized, or once he, he recognized and was relieved of his ignorance. Because you see, ignorance is acceptable, but arrogance is not. Yeah. See, ignorance is actually relatively simple and easy to fix, but arrogance is quite difficult to fix. Ignorance is you just don't know something. Right. That's okay. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that you don't know. Why? Because the world is filled with so much knowledge and information. Yeah. Is that, okay, 100,000 books, that sounds like a lot. You know how many books are in the British Museum, or the, the British Library? 13 million. Wow. 
followed by 160 million digitized books. That's a lot of knowledge that you don't know, that I don't know. So it's okay to be ignorant. If you, if you face a challenge, if you face something in your life that you're, not, that you're ignorant of, that's okay. But you can't be arrogant. What is arrogance? Arrogance is believing something about yourself that is not true. Now, many people, especially smart, well-educated people, have a major problem with being wrong. And it's what psychologists, uh, specifically uh, Guy Winch, call psychological rigidity. Basically what it is, is it's a fragile ego. <laughs> what he says is that people can't accept that they're wrong because it damages their ego, which is not acceptable to them. This is why many people don't change their beliefs, particularly with God. It's not that people don't want to believe in God. A lot of people do want to believe in God. It's not that people can't believe in God. The issue is that people are unable to accept that they were wrong. That their previous beliefs were wrong and incorrect and therefore need changing to develop new beliefs. Some people think that they are God's gift to humanity. <laughs> That they're just the, the personification, the embodiment of knowledge and wisdom. Reality check. You're not. You're not. And see, that's okay. It's okay. It's, we're, we're limited human beings. Let's not pretend that we're not. See, arrogance is believing something about yourself that's not true. It's believing you're more talented, more intelligent, more attractive, more uh, whatever it may be. But it's, it's not true. Yeah. It's living a narcissistic delusion. See, arrogance is a mental illness. It's an inability to accept reality. Like, no, 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 no. I, I can't accept this truth, so I'm going to completely lie and completely deceive myself. I'm going to create this alternate reality, this alternate fantasy that is more akin to my liking, that's more acceptable to my fragile ego. Man, arrogance is scary. It is frightening. And you see it. You see it in people, particularly gifted, talented people. Who's someone that uh, is really like going out there at the moment? Lewis Hamilton. I don't know if any of you guys like Formula One. Yeah, yeah Formula One's great. I like it. Some of the, it's, it's so extreme, everything about Formula One. It's so demanding. It's so intense. That's why people love it. Now, Lewis Hamilton, for those of you that don't know, is arguably the greatest Formula One driver that's ever lived. He has the most wins at 103 uh, race wins, and he's tied with Michael Schumacher for uh, seven title wins. He's the, the most. And he's incredible. Is that I've watched Lewis Hamilton go from last place to first place. Yeah. Like it's, it's really like awe-inspiring to watch. But this season, he's not been so hot. See, this season, he is sixth. Not third, not fourth, sixth. And what he said is, yeah, man, the, the, the car, the performance isn't on. Yeah, it's, it's just the, the, the team. Yep, I'm just struggling with my team. And I, how am I supposed to win races if I don't have the team? I mean, I can only do, or I can only work with the car that I'm being given. There's only one problem. See, Lewis Hamilton has a teammate. His name is George Russell, who has the same team and drives the same car. And he's currently in fourth place. And he has double the points that Lewis Hamilton has. Wow. So the problem's not the car. The problem isn't the car, is the problem is that he's just having a bad season. Yeah. But what's crazy is, is that he's in this arrogant delusion. Oh man, I just, I can't be successful because people are against me and my teammates are sabotaging me. You got the same teammates as your other guy. Yeah. What, they're not trying to sabotage you, they want to win. They, they want you to win for them because the more races you win, the better that they do. Right. You know what he's in, he's in right now? He's embroiled in this controversy over his jewelry. So he has all these like earrings and necklaces and nose rings. And there's a new uh, race head who's like, okay, no, you can't, do, you can't wear jewelry because of a safety hazard. So no, right, no drivers are allowed to wear jewelry. Now, he's the only one who wears jewelry because it's a safety hazard. And he thinks, oh, it'll be fine. Like if there's a fire, like totally, it won't affect me. Like it'll be cool. 
But now he's in this this embroiled battle where he's potentially going to be banned from uh, the race in Monaco in two races time because he doesn't want to give up his jewelry. He's like, yeah, man, this my my jewelry is just a part of who I am, and I can't take it off. It's I I can't do this. It's like, mate, you're sixth. Like you you can't even you can't even you don't have a leg to stand on this season. Why are you fighting about jewelry? Because he's out there. He's out there. He's living this arrogant fantasy, even with all of his talent, even with all of his past accomplishments, which are extraordinary. Here we see is that he's not willing to be humble. He's not willing to admit, you know what? Yeah, I really shouldn't have been wearing jewelry. That's probably dangerous. And uh, I'm just going just gonna to take it off and I'll wear it after the race. It's okay. If I put on my watch like I do after the race, it'll be okay. But he doesn't want to. And uh, it's really sad. Like, I, I think it'd be really sad. We'll see how it goes. Is that if he's able to pull it up or, but uh, last season, again, he was, he didn't win and he's kind of steadily declined. It's like, man, that's be disappointing. I wish he would just be humble. I wish he would just be like, you know what, guys, it's been a rough season and uh, yeah, so the car, whatever, but I just, I got to do better and uh, I'm going to work on it. going to go back. I'm going to train harder, right. but uh, I've, I've not really been living up to my full potential this, this season. That's cool. Everyone can get behind that. Everyone's like, yeah, come on, Lewis Hamilton, you're the best. It's okay to admit that you're wrong. It's okay to admit your mistake. But so many people find it so difficult to do because of their itty bitty fragile ego. Don't let your ego stop you from growing and stop you from living by the truth. You want to know the best people for admitting that they're wrong? Christians. You know why? Because it's a prerequisite to becoming a Christian. You got to repent. That means, guys, Jesus, I was wrong. The way that I thought, the way that I lived, this was wrong. But I'm going to change and I'm going to be somebody different. And when you do that, it then actually becomes much easier to admit that you're wrong in the future. Because I make lots of mistakes. I probably make more mistakes than most of you. But I, I try my best to admit it quickly. Like, you know what? Yeah, that was a really bad idea. I, I shouldn't have said this. I'm really sorry. I, I know I hurt your feelings. That was totally not on. Please forgive me. And you just admit your mistakes and you move on. Yeah. And this is what you see about Paul is that in, if we go back to our story in uh, Acts, Acts chapter 19 now. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. It says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the interior road uh, and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Simple question. They answered, No, we've not even heard there was a Holy Spirit. And Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul comes and he meets these disciples. That means that they had been made into a disciple by someone. Likely Apollos, because there were parts missing in their discipleship. Now, a lot of times when people, when they grow up religious, they can be like, yeah, I was raised in the Bible, and this person, father such and such, taught me this, and I had this amazing mentor in my life that helped me. But then there are gaps, like really simple, really obvious gaps. Like, did you receive the Holy Spirit? It's like a yes or no question. They're like, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. <laughs> and it's like, okay, then what baptism did you receive? It's like, John's baptism. It's like, okay, well, that's not the right baptism because actually you need to be baptized with Jesus' baptism. So then they went away and they had to think about it and they had to pray about it and they had to really go and do, and, and they, they really wrestled with it. So, no, they got baptized. Yeah. Simple. They recognize, okay, maybe we, we made a mistake, guys. Uh, the guy who taught us, whoever it was, he, he, he missed some stuff out. That's okay. It's okay. It's like, you, you know what? We're just ignorant. We were ignorant of the Holy Spirit. We were ignorant of the baptism of Jesus. Nobody taught us. That's okay. Here, I'll teach you real quick. It's going to be easy, and then you get baptized. No problem. But many people don't do this. Like, for example, I was baptized as a child, and I remember when I was studying the Bible, that was a big barrier for me. It was like, okay, I can accept everything else, but just baptism, but like, uh, but I don't want to admit that I was wrong. 
because I really believed it. And other people around me really believed it. But nowhere in the Bible do you baptize children. Nowhere. Nowhere. So what does that mean? That means that the Catholic Church is wrong. That means that the Orthodox Church is wrong. That's okay if you were raised Catholic, if you were raised Orthodox, or you were raised Baptist, Evangelical, whatever, like I was raised. That's okay. You just got to be humble. Yeah. And you'd be like, oh, so, so you don't baptize children? No, you don't. It's not in the Bible. You baptize disciples. You got to be made a disciple first, and you got to be baptized. Oh, okay, well, make me a disciple and baptize me. That's very simple. It's very straightforward. This is the challenge for us. The challenge for us is when you're wrong, admit your mistake quickly and move on. In anything, like particularly in relationships. Like I love my, my dear wife and I, I make mistakes and wrong her regularly. So what do I do? Just apologize quickly. <laughs> like, babe, I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. And because she's a disciple, she forgives me. Yeah. It's awesome. And we move on. And you can do that with anyone. Yeah. You can do it with your parents. You can do it with your friends. You can do it with your teachers. You can do it with, with whoever's in your life. When you make a mistake, just be humble. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Just accept that you, you made a mistake and just apologize. Just repent. But if you don't really understand Jesus, you don't understand the concept of grace, it's really hard to do that. Right. See, as Christians, it's really easy because we understand that, that God doesn't hold our mistakes against us. Like I even see this is that likely it was Apollos that made these incorrect disciples. But you notice that Luke doesn't say Apollos made these incorrect disciples. <laughs> Why? He doesn't need to throw it in his face. Like, hey, look how you messed up. Look how you, you see you did it wrong there. Like, he saw you did it wrong. You don't need to smash it in. Let's like, show you how dumb you are. Oh, you think Alexandria. Oh, no, you made a mistake. That's not what Christianity is. When you make a mistake, there's grace. When you make a mistake and when you're humble, you can get help. You can be strengthened. You can be taught. You can be picked up. And so that's what's really inspiring about being a Christian. Because I make so many mistakes. But I try my best to be humble. I try my best to admit it quickly and move on. Yeah. That's what I want to challenge you about. Maybe you need to become a Christian so that you can be humble, so that you can get help when you make a mistake. Instead of living in this arrogant, delusional, mental illness fantasy that so many people in our generation are doing today. Yeah. So challenge, when you're wrong, admit it, be humble, get help, get grace that Jesus provides. Amen. Come on, call me. Amen. Point number three. Born for a greater purpose. What happens, Paul gathers these uh, now genuine, true disciples, and he takes them with them to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. If we go to the second part of verse 9, it says he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who had lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Point number three, born for a greater purpose. Paul takes these now disciples that have been correctly taught the word of God to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. The lecture hall of Tyrannus was the center of education, learning, debate, philosophy for the city of Ephesus. And the city of Ephesus was a major city in ancient Rome. And it says that he has these discussions. He reasons. He, he challenges these people. And what happens, he makes disciples there who then go on to evangelize all of Asia Minor. This is an, an area of two million people. Why? Because the lecture hall of Tyrannus was filled with the best of the best of the best. And that's where Paul wanted to go. Paul's like, okay, I want to go to where there are more Apollos. I want to get the geniuses. I want to get those who are articulate, those who are athletic, those who are creative. I want to get people that have been given natural talents and abilities by God, and I want to teach them the truth and teach them that they've been born for a greater purpose than the one that they realize. And what happened? He was successful. He was effective. And he didn't go around evangelizing all of Asia Minor. The disciples that he made went on to have an even greater impact than him because he showed them that they were born for a greater purpose. When I think about here in Edinburgh, and I go to the University of Edinburgh, it's incredible when you meet some of the students there. They are so smart. They're so talented. They're gifted. They're articulate. They usually come from a prominent, successful families who are affluent, is that most of them are, are intact, where they have uh, both parents in their life, which is really rare in our modern society. And it's like, wow. I meet so many privileged people from the University of Edinburgh. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with being privileged, but that privilege comes with God and it comes with an expectation that you use the gifts and talents and abilities not for your own selfish gains, but to change the world. That's the expectation, is that you've been given this gift to use, not to abuse. When I think about this, it makes me think of an incredible inspirational young man by the name of William Whitling Borden. He was born in the year 1887 into a very wealthy uh, family in Chicago. And at the age of 16, he went to private schools his whole life. And uh, at the age of 16, his parents sent him on a chaperone trip of the world, which 100 years ago was quite an impressive feat. And he traveled all over the world. He went to Europe. He went to Africa. He went to the Middle East. He went to China. And then on his way back, he, he eventually came. And uh, in London, before he was going to come back to America, he sort of reflected on all of his travels and the impact of, of seeing all these cultures and, and peoples. And he, there he decided, he says, okay, I am going to devote my life to God. I'm going to use all of the wealth, all of the privilege, all of the incredible resources that I've been given that other people don't have, and I'm going to use this for God. And in his Bible, he wrote the words, he wrote the dates where he was in London, and he wrote the words, no reserve. He says, I'm not going to live with anything held back. I'm going to give my all. I'm going to give 100%. Everything that I have, I'm going to give to this life, and I'm going to give to God. At the end of his two-year journey traveling around the world at the age of 18, he enrolled in Yale College in uh, 1905. It's Ivy League school. That most of us, we wouldn't have the grades to get into Yale. Some of us maybe, I don't know, but if you were there, if you did, you would be there and not here. So <laughs> this guy was awesome. He was very highly intelligent, very successful, very wealthy, and he went to Yale. And what he did was he's like, okay, I'm going to give my all for God. He started having daily prayer groups that in the span of two years had infiltrated every aspect of the college and had gatherings of a thousand people every day. When he turned 18, his parents gave him a million dollars. What would you do with a million dollars at 18? Well, what he did was he started a hospital that he privately funded because he saw that there was a need for people who needed to get medical care, they needed to be taken care of, there was a, there was a need for the homeless to be able to get food and, and help. He's like, okay, I have money. So I can just give my money to start up a hospital, start up a refuge, start up a shelter. I'm not going to wait for the government to come do it. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to say, I can do it. What can you do? You might not have a million dollars, but you got something. Are you using what God has given you to meet the needs of the world today? He's like, I'm I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to have any reserve. I'm going to come and I'm going to do something. I'm going to have an impact in the world. What happened is that uh, there was a very uh, world-renowned English traveler that came to America, and he toured all of America. And then at the end of his time, he was asked, so you toured the vast lands of America, and what was the most impressive thing about America to you? And he said, the most impressive thing about America was the sight of that young millionaire kneeling with his arm around a bum in Yale Hope Hospital. Mm. Like That's extraordinary. This young guy's a millionaire, and he's, ba- he's getting down on his knees to help this, this bum, this homeless person. That's extraordinary. I've never seen anything like that in my life. When he graduated from uh, Yale University, he decided to become a missionary instead of work for the family business, which was involved in silver mining in Colorado. And at this, his father disinherited him, said, you're dead to me. You're not going to get any more money. You, you're You're nothing because you're not doing what I've told you you must do. And at this, he wrote in his Bible, he had no reserve in London when he was 18 years old. And here at the age of 20, 22, he said the words, no retreat. He says, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to be intimidated by the forces of the world. I'm not going to let other people threaten me. I'm not going to be afraid to go and to cause controversy. I'm not going to be afraid of my parents. I'm not going to let them control my life and limit my destiny. No, no, no. No retreats. I'm not backing down from nobody. I'm going to do what's right because it's right. 
at the age of 22. He decide, he, uh, so he, he decided, okay, I'm going to become a missionary. And I'm going to evangelize particularly the Muslim worlds. And the, the Muslims that were most on his heart were the Muslims in Western China, the Uyghur people. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to have a, a, an impact in the Muslim worlds. At 22, he became the director of Moody Bible Institute. This shows, hey, you can do great things even if you're young. Yeah. Is that he's like, I'm not going to let my age limit me. Is that God has blessed me with time, with money, with resources, with talents. Is that he was an incredible athlete. He was in uh, wrestling and, and uh, different uh, track and field and sailing. He was a president of his fraternity. He was so gifted. And he's like, I'm going to use these gifts. I'm not going to let anyone hold me back. Yeah, I'll be, the, I'll be the director at the age of 22. It doesn't matter that everyone's older than me. I'm going to lead by example. I'm not going to let anyone look down on me just as the Bible says. At the age of 25, he moved to Cairo, Egypt to learn Arabic. And shortly after arriving, he contracted meningitis and died wow. three weeks later. Oh his mother was scheduled to arrive to meet him and to be with him. And she arrived uh, shortly after his death. And he was only 25. And she went and she, she attended the small funeral that was held for him there. And they had uh, memorial services in Yale and other parts, of, uh, other parts of America. And she saw his Bible. And she opened it up and she saw in London the words, no reserve. Then she saw how, uh, after he graduated Yale, saw the words, no retreats. Mm -hmm. And based on the date, it was shortly before he died, were the words, no regrets. No regrets. Man, we think that we're invincible. We think that we're going to live a long life, that we have a large amount of time left to leave our impact and our mark on this world. We have another 20, 30, 40 years left, and then I'm going to die, and I'll see what I can do then. He didn't. 25. And he died. But he was able to look back on his, his short life and say, I had no regrets. I wouldn't have done it differently. Many people, they think like, okay, I've still got time. I can live my life for myself. I can pursue pleasure. I can do things my way. And then in time, when I get older, when I have a family, when, when I really want to leave an impact on the world, then I'll get serious. Then I'll become benevolent. Then I'll become charitable. You don't know. You don't know what happened tomorrow. You don't know if you'll live past 25. You don't know. Every day is a gift. And he lived every day to the max. He lived with no regrets. In his will, he left his remaining fortune dedicated to missions, to evangelizing the Muslim world. It was $800,000, which when you calculate for inflation today is the equivalent of $23 million. No reserve. He's going to give it all. Because what's he going to do with money when he's dead? It's like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to give everything. I'm going to give every drop of lifeblood that I have. And then when I'm gone, I'm gone. And I'm going to give all the resources. I'm going to give everything that I could possibly do to have the greatest impact possible. Paul went to the school with the best of the best. These were people that wanted to change the world. There are people in the city that want to change the world. How do I know? Because historically, there have been many. There have been many inventors, philosophers, politicians, military leaders, religious figures, athletes that have changed the world from such a small part of the world. Yeah. has had such a profound impact. Yeah. And I believe there are still people here today that realize they were born for something greater. There are people here today in the University of Edinburgh, in the, the different cities and the, the different streets and the, the communities and everything. There are people here that recognize they're born for something greater. Yeah. They, they recognize the, the talent, the privilege, the resources, the education, everything that they've been given is not for themselves. It's to use to change the world. Yeah. There are people here that truly want to live the way that William Bortman lived. I want to challenge you, live that life. Because you don't know how much of life you're going to get to live. You don't know how much more time you have. So live every day to the full. We need to be people who live with no reserve. That don't hold anything back for, for tomorrow, for next week, for next year. Now give everything. Give it all. 
Live life to the full. That's what Jesus says, is that I've come to give you life to the full. And you can't live a full life without Jesus. It's impossible. Give your life to God. Give everything to live a full life with no reserve. Live with no retreats. Don't be intimidated by other people who want to threaten you, that want to control you, that want to manipulate you. Don't be manipulated by your, your friends and your family and your peers and, and whatever other people think you should do or how you should live. No, do what's right because it's right. Yeah. And then lastly, live with no regrets. Yeah. Don't look back and be like, man, I wish I had done it differently. I wish I had taken a different turn. I wish I had gone on a different path because then maybe I could have had an impact then maybe I could have really changed the world for good. Don't do that. Don't look back with regrets. Take that plunge. Take that step of faith to be the men, to be the women that God is calling us to be. In conclusion, you're not smarter than God, no matter how smart you are, no matter how much education you have. You're not smarter than God. You can't know everything. That's okay. Just be humble. If you don't know something, just admit it. Just admit when you make mistakes, let people help you because that's when other people can come into your life who are sent by God to teach you that you were born for a greater purpose. Every single one of you was born for a greater purpose and some of you don't know it. Be humble. Learn about your purpose. Let God use you, have an impact so that we can change the world just as they did in the first century. We're going to change it in the 21st century. And to God be all the glory. Amen.